Well, welcome. On uh, behalf of my co-chairs, uh, Jamie Cameron and uh, Sonia Lawrence, I want to welcome you to the 17th Annual Constitutional Cases Conference. We're delighted to have you here today. Um, welcome you on behalf of uh, Osgood, as well as our sponsors, LexisNexis and the uh, York Center for Public Policy and Law. We really look forward each year to uh, looking back and considering key trends, uh, moments, developments, and themes from the Supreme Court of Canada's jurisprudence in the past year. And this is a special year, of course. We've returned uh, up to Osgood, and we're delighted that you've come to uh, join us. You'll see as the day unfolds, we've, we've sold out, and we're delighted to have you here. Um, You'll see if you open up your uh, packages that we have an incredibly rich, a exciting program. I'm going to say that a bit more about that uh, momentarily. Let me just give you one update about the program. Um, a little update. Giving recent developments, one developments you're aware of, um, I'm sorry to report that uh, an extra parallel session that we were planning to run, uh, we've actually canceled. There will be no uh, maritime law session. Uh, for the Constitutional Cases Conference. Okay. Um, so, but before I give you a bit of an introduction to the day, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Lawrence Austin, a great supporter and contributor to the event, to welcome you to Osgood. Thank you, um, Ben. Welcome uh, to uh, all of you. And as Ben uh, mentioned, uh, this is a special kind of welcome. Uh, now that we have um, uh, moved this signature uh, annual event uh, here to the main campus of the law school. And for much of, I think, almost all of the 17 years um, uh, that uh, have, where well, this is the 17th, the 16 uh, years preceding, uh, have been down uh, at um, uh, our professional development facility uh, downtown, which is lovely. But uh, we thought um, the move here not only uh, could make this event uh, more accessible, but also uh, really strengthen uh, the linkages between the uh, academics, the uh, the bar, the government officials, the luminaries, the students, uh, and uh, and many others who care deeply about constitutional issues who come together uh, for this uh, this event. So it it does have a family feel. That's certainly one of the reasons I look forward to it uh, so much uh, each year. Is uh, because of uh, not just the amazing panels and how much I learn, uh, but the great uh, uh, friends and uh, fellow travelers uh, who uh, you know know each other often uh, feel a great uh, bond with each other but rarely have the chance uh, because of their day jobs uh, to uh, see each other and engage uh, in this way uh, as with so many uh, conferences uh, it doesn't come together in a self-executing uh, way it takes a tremendous amount of organizing and uh, work and thinking through the different moving parts. Uh, so, you, you know, we always, um, and many speakers during the day will thank uh, the organizers, but uh, we often uh, do uh, forget to include, uh, not just in this case, um, uh, ben and uh, Jamie and Sonia, but uh, all the many people in the Osgood uh, staff and our various uh, teams who work uh, so hard to make this day uh, the really amazing experience I know it will be. So just before we start, join me in a round of applause thanking all of them for getting us started. Uh, and the last word on location, uh, you know, obviously uh, you're not just going to be in this room. Uh, we hope uh, during lunch and during the breaks you have a chance to explore uh, this uh, remarkable building, which uh, in 2011 was kind of reimagined from its uh, original bricks and mortars with a heavy emphasis on brick and mortar, uh, and now has become uh, a space that really does um, uh, let the light uh, shine, and it's not lost on me or those from the Osgood community uh, that uh, in 2011 this building was officially opened uh, with a ribbon cutting and it was Jim Flaherty who cut the ribbon uh, as um, our graduate and uh, as a real uh, loyal and passionate supporter of the law school. Uh, he was telling great stories of how they made him be a referee on the Osgood hockey team because he had come from Princeton on a hockey scholarship and it would have been unfair for him to play because you know what, what would the other players do so he refed instead and he was telling uh, wonderful stories of his law school years here in uh, really a, 
a golden era for the law school. So that connection uh, has been on my mind uh, today as we reflect on uh, his legacy and accomplishments. And uh, the other amazing uh, piece, um, uh, it seems to happen every April, is how much of the day's discussions are affected in real time. We have important decisions coming down you know, in a few minutes uh, that will bear on some of the discussions. Uh, we've already seen uh, headlines in the paper uh, arising from another one of the um, uh, studies that will be discussed uh, here today on uh, judicial uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, still fresh from really significant uh, statements from uh, the Supreme Court and have given rise to national debates uh, on a number of the areas that we're exploring. So I hope uh, you have that sense of um, uh, being in the moment, uh, but also the importance of uh, a period to reflect, as Ben said, on uh, what has been an extraordinarily eventful uh, year, and I'm uh, uh, very much uh, looking forward to participating. It's a huge privilege for Osgood to uh, host this event, and it's made possible by all of you coming together uh, this year, and for many of you, it's um, a long-standing uh, date on your calendar. So I hope you're feeling the Osgood love uh, all day, and look forward to having a chance to connect with many of you. And I will turn it back to Ben for some of the uh, uh, logistics, housekeeping, uh, and uh, getting things underway. So welcome again, and thank you. Okay, well, um, a, a couple of points just to uh, remind you of as we get going, and I'm going to orient you a bit both to the program and to the building. Before we get there, uh, just a reminder for each of the panels, uh, please, if you're going to ask questions, and we hope you will, use the microphones in the rooms, uh, that both for amplifying and also um, recording. Uh, secondly, you'll see signs for washrooms on the main floor here about halfway down that beautiful um, uh, bright hall. On the left are the washrooms. On the right is the Hallowell Center where uh, um, lunch will be served. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, you'll see, first of all, if you have any questions along the way, of course you can call on Jamie Cameron, uh, Sonia Lawrence, or myself as co-chairs. You've also uh, all had emails from Jody Ann Rowe Butler, who is really uh, running the event in e every meaningful way. And there are a number of students who have uh, volunteered their time. I don't know if any are in the room right now to identify themselves, right? Um, and uh, off to the side, you'll see them around. They're happy to help. They have volunteer badges on. Um, Take out your programs. It's a full, busy day. Let me just take a moment before we get to our first uh, talk to orient you to um, the program and the building. Today we're going to be in three rooms. Um, the plenaries, our morning plenary on appointments, um, our closing plenary on charter change, they'll be here in this room. Also in this room will be the keynote uh, after lunch. Uh, we're delighted, very much looking forward to hearing from uh, Dahlia Lithic. Um, and we'll be here in this room, uh, so we'll see you again here. Now, there are breakout sessions, both in the morning and the afternoon. For the morning, if you're in Senate reform once more, you'll stay here in this room. Indigenous peoples in the Constitution, honor and community, you're upstairs in room 2001. So if you just leave the moot courtroom, this, this room, uh, you can go up the main staircase and 2001 is just to your left. In the afternoon, the, Charter's val the Charter Values panel will be in this room and the Criminal Law panel will be upstairs in 2001. We then return, of course, to this room for the closing plenary. Refreshments will um, be served between panels just outside where you had your breakfast. Lunch is going to be served in the aforementioned Hallowell Center down the hallway on your right hand side. There's food there, uh, there's places to eat, there's also the junior common room which is just a little ways past it. You can sit, enjoy, enjoy yourself for no more than 45 minutes uh, because at that point we'll be bringing you back here for uh, the keynote. So it's a tight schedule today and delighted that there's a lot of people. Um, so we've given a mandate to all of our moderators to rule with an iron fist and uh, so they're going to be fierce on, on times. 
But even before we move to our morning plenary, we have uh, a wonderful, much anticipated component of the yearly conference, the opening address and review of the past year at the Supreme Court of Canada. And this is a long tradition, um, as I say, much, look forward, much looked forward to by attendees, and it's been masterfully delivered in the past by uh, Patrick Monaghan, um, by Jamie Cameron last year, and this year I'm delighted to introduce Professor Sonia Lawrence, who will be delivering this year's uh, review. Most of you know uh, Professor Lawrence, um, a central part of Osgood's faculty since her appointment in, in 2001. Uh, Professor Lawrence earned her LLB from the University of Toronto and then earned two master's degrees, one in social work from the University of Toronto and an LLM from Yale Law School. She was law clerk to Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin and since joining the academy has been just a powerful voice in the analysis of equality jurisprudence um, through her writing and through her scholarship and contributions to feminist legal theory. She's currently the director of the Institute for Feminist Legal Studies here at Osgood, and through that role she's been a true leader, as many of you know in the field, doing the indispensable, very hard and often thankless work of uh, linking scholars and facilitating the flow of ideas, the flow of research in the, in the field. Um, and if you've read her uh, scholarship, um, if you've um, watched her truly rich, very rewarding blog that she does for the IFLS, you'll no doubt share my view that she's in uh, her own modest way a simply superb writer, a superb legal and social analyst, and personally, um, I regard her as one of the most reliably incisive and creative uh, minds in the field, which is, um, I must say, quite something uh, for someone who I also regard as just one of the most uh, fine people um, that I know. My experience is that uh, Sonia has a unique capacity to help you to see things quite differently, and that's part of why uh, she is such a loved and effective teacher and such a valued colleague. And so we're really in for a treat. Um, my pleasure to introduce Professor Sonia Lawrence. Um, I think what Ben means is I helped him choose this shirt tie combination. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so thanks um, to all of you for coming here. I do want to give a special shout out to my constitutional law students um, who have been telling me for a long time that they wanted to volunteer for this conference, to which I responded, no, you do not. It is the day before exams. And um, they kept telling me that they did want to, and I kept telling them, you'll change your mind. And they are here, and I'm delighted um, to have them here to be able to meet all of you, and I hope you get a chance to talk to some of them, because I'm sure that one day um, they'll be our colleagues. Okay, so my job is to give the overview of the Supreme Court's year. Um, my challenge is that I have about 25 minutes to do it. I want to direct you first to, um, to the website for the conference and the papers page. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a roadmap. The papers page where you can download the complete table of constitutional cases before uh, I start to give the overview in case you want the complete table because I'm not going to discuss all of the cases. Um, this is this is Prezi. I know sometimes the bar for technology and law is very low, but this is actually a very simple thing. Okay, um, so I'm going to start with the typical, so this is the table that I'm talking about, and so it's on the website if you want it, and it lists all of the cases, uh, the constitutional cases that were covered this year. Okay, so I'm going to start with the brief uh, traditional by the numbers rundown. Um, there were, the court released 74 judgments in 2013. That's consistent with the recent past and only one less than last year. Of these, 11 were clearly constitutional cases. That's the same number as last year, about 15% of the total. Nine of those 11 cases were 
charter cases. One considered Section 35 Aboriginal law, and one was a division of powers case um, that involved the doctrines of interjurisdictional immunity and federal paramountcy. That's obviously good news for anybody who needs an examination question in constitutional law. Um, last year, like last year, only, oh, sorry, there you go. Oops. Yeah, sorry guys. Okay, so like last year, only um, two of the ch charter cases were the um, were successful for the claimant, so that's about 22%. The division of powers claim failed. The constitutional claim um, that's actually decided through the concept of honor of the crown in Manitoba Métis was a, was a substantial, although I would say not complete success for the claimants. So in terms of how the Supreme Court is dealing with the decisions of the courts below, um, I can tell you that five of the appeals were completely dismissed. One was substantially dismissed. Four were allowed in part, and only once was the decision of a Canadian appellate court completely overturned by the Supreme Court in 2013. So the court issued, I'm jumping around here a bit, sorry. Okay, close your eyes for a sec. <laughs> The court issued uh, unanimous opinions in seven of 11, of, the, of 11 cases in 2013. There were multiple opinions in only four of the cases and dissenting opinions in only three. So the chart I have here um, illustrates the way that the work was fairly evenly split. This chart just illustrates how many sets of reasons each judge authored or co-authored. This is not obviously sophisticated statistical work. Um, but surprise, surprise, narrow lead on all the other judges for Justice Karakatsanis. Um, given last year's uh, newspaper comments about her productivity, this may not be an enti entirely surprising, although of course this represents only the concept constitutional cases. I'm not talking about the entire, um, uh, the entire spread of 74 cases, and I'm not sure how that would come out if we did that. So um, as for voting blocks, you know, maybe the most interesting one is the revelation that Justices Fish and LaBelle both sat for all 11 of these cases and signed on to the same opinion in all 11 cases. And that might bear further exploration if we're, it's something we're interested in, but of course it's, this is such a tiny sample. And it's very difficult to draw conclusions on such a sample, especially when the whole court agreed in seven of the 11 cases. But in terms of voting blocks and the ways in which we might um, be interested in questions about which judges are agreeing with each other, um, in terms of questions about appointments particularly, um, the only one of note, I think, is about Justices Fish and LaBelle. But rather than try to squeeze more meaning out of these numbers, because obviously, not a statistician. Um, I'm just going to turn now to this year's crop of cases. Oh, sorry, but before I do that, I will just show you that there's really not much difference in this year's constitutional cases um, from last year and even going back to 2010. This chart shows um, the percentage of unanimous, at the top line is unanimous constitutional cases from 2013 and below 2012, so very close. The next set of four bars is charter success going, um, so claimants who were successful in charter cases going from 2013 to 2010, very similar. The percentage of charter cases in any given year is the next line, so quite similar with some bump in 2010. Then the percentage of constitutional cases, again, it does seem to be going down, but um, this year is not significantly different from last year. The percentage of appeals allowed kind of moves back and forth in a relatively narrow range over the last four years. And then the last, um, the last line just um, illustrates the complete caseload of the court. And the other lines are um, percentages. The final line is just a straight number. So uh, hovering just above, uh, between kind of just below 70 and just over 80 for the last four years, which again, as previous versions of this conference have, um, have noted is, is lower than it had been about a decade ago, but has been relatively consistent for the past, say, five to ten years, five to seven years. Okay, so that's the numbers. And now I think we can turn to some of the cases. So the year started ordinarily uh, enough. Um, 
although with a little more media scrutiny, because like Bedford, which formed the other bookend on the 2013 cases, Quebec versus A had more than enough in it to interest the media. It's a family law dispute between one of Quebec's most high-profile couples, an immigrant from Brazil and the Quebecois self-made billionaire she met on the Brazilian beach when she was 17. So despite the anonymity of the style of cause, the case is called Quebec versus A, um, the case was, there was a lot about it that was kind of made for public consumption. So what A was challenging in this case is the exclusion of common law spouses from property division and support obligations under the civil code. Um, there's a way in which this case is just another one of a long string of claimant loses Section 15 cases, but it does offer a few novelties, and I'll spend a bit of time on this case because we're not actually having a panel on Section 15 this year. So in particular, there were four sets of reasons in this case. Four sets of reasons in a year where seven of 11 um, constitutional decisions were unanimous. Um, and this, I think, indicates the continued inability of the court to agree on how equality should be interpreted and applied. So five judges agreed that, what, that Section 15 was violated, but it took them three sets of reasons to do that. Four judges agreed with Justice LaBelle that there was no violation. At Section 1, the fracture deepened, with Justice McLaughlin moving from agreeing that the um, Section 15 had been violated to finding justification under Section 1. Justice Abella found for the claimant, and Justices Deschamps, Cromwell, and Kerkitsanis um, had a mixed result, finding that one of the provisions was justified and the other one was not. So around this, the difference between property division and support. The splits don't really follow an easy to discern pattern. And so all the women found a violation, but there was substantial disagreement amongst them at Section 1. Two of the Quebec judges found no violation, but the first one found at least, but the, another Quebec judge, Justice Deschamps, found at least one unjustified violation. And we can also look at this case as one in which it is the Chief Justice in her move from finding the Section 15 claim made out to finding the violation justified who ultimately decides the outcome. And some of you may think that this is a classic McLaughlin kind of split the difference move. Um, but at what happens at Section 1 is the positions kind of shift and harden. So Justice Abella is finding the violation failing both minimal impairment and proportionality. But what the Chief Justice offers at Section 1 is a deeply deferential analysis um, for the Quebec legislature, finding the exclusion fully justified. Um, it's a relief, I think, for me to see both Justice Abella and the set of three concurring judges addressing directly the question of choice as it applies to marriage versus not marriage. Um, Hester Lassard at UVic described the reasons of Justice LaBelle, so finding no violation, as illustrating the way that choice language serves as ideological glue, binding the twin pillars of classical liberalism, formal equality, negative liberty, to a concept of conjugality and property rights, which were at issue in this case, rooted in a conservative and patriarchal tradition. And I think that um, as she did in Hatterian Brethren, one of the reasons that the Chief Justice um, finds this violation justified is that she takes an approach at minimal impairment which refuses to consider anything other than the goals the legislature seeks to achieve. And she defines those goals as maximizing choice and autonomy for couples in Quebec. So this avoids paternalism, um, she concludes. And this approach to Section 1 really strikes a discordant note when you compare it with what she said in the Section 15 analysis. Her approach to the Section 1 analysis reads out entirely the context in which decisions about marriage or not marriage are made, right? a context in which the financial imbalances between spouses are heavily gendered. And there's a certain, um, the irony of describing this scheme as one that avoids paternalism by allowing choice, given the arguments of so many commentators that it supports patriarchy, would be kind of a delicious irony if it wasn't um, fairly disappointing. The, uh, <laughs> The other issue, of course, is that this is a civil code case from Quebec, and most of the reasons are really freighted with reference to Quebec particularities, and those are unavoidable. There's a long history um, of the development of these uh, 
uh, portions of the code set out by Justice LaBelle. There's the federalism inflected deference of the Chief Justice's Section 1 approach. Um, it was Quebec specificities that drove all of the judges who denied the claim, although they appear in different points of the analysis. So in the end, as always, it's going to prove difficult to extract a general rule about Section 15 um, from this case because the judges, many of the judges are claiming to agree when it you read the reasons, it looks like they disagree. Um, the disagreements about discrimination questions are really fundamental. The meaning um, and content of the concept of choice uh, is so contested, and the question of Quebec looms in ways that are acknowledged and not acknowledged. So, on the other hand, for a Section 15 case, none of this is new. It's just not a decision that's going to help people who are trying to bring cases or um, defend the government from um, claims of discrimination under Section 15. So, that was January. The following month, another relatively unsurprising but instructive decision, Whatcott. Um, Whatcott actually it came out of Saskatchewan and pushed a number of buttons um, with facts that brought together religious freedom, homophobia, freedom of speech, and human rights codes. So these issues are often gathered under the rubric of clash of rights. And this clash between usually religion and equality rights has become a really quite standard uh, media trope. But the challenge of understanding the ways that those two rights, equality um, and religion, coexist is also reflected in two major issues which kind of popped up and then festered throughout 2013. The Parti Québécois um, proposed Charte de Valeur and the proposal from Trinity Western University that it be permitted to open a law school which would operate under the well-known code of conduct that bans uh, homosexual activity by all students, faculty and staff. So for all these various anxieties coalesced around what caught, but the decision is really largely confirmatory of past approaches to hate speech that we saw in 1990s Keekstra and 1996's Ross. So once the, the court kind of disposes of those portions of the Saskatchewan human rights provision, which um, prohibit exposing people to ridicule as opposed to hatred, it was smooth sailing. Um, the final balancing in particular takes the approach of earlier cases describing hate speech as a degraded form of speech. So political speech it may be, but it's restrictive and exclusionary. It's speech that attempts to shut down dialogue rather than promote it. So in this case, the clash of rights resulted in the court upholding equality even when faced with what Cott's claim that his religious beliefs required that he preach the word of God against homosexuality. So in the end, whatever attempt we were making to make this case the centerpiece of the great 2013 clash of rights battle royale kind of fizzles out with a decision that just puts us back to where we have been for many years. So I'm now going to briefly turn to Manitoba Métis which will be covered by at least one of the speakers um, in this morning's panel and, other, and I think on our Honor and Community panel. So it's a case about the Manitoba Act 1870 and the provisions of that act which promised land allotments to Métis children. It's a very long decision and the sweeping language of the majority contrasts really sharply with the dissent of Justices Rothstein and Moldaver who argue that the majority decision which focuses on the issue of the honor of the crown has created a common law constitution constitutional obligation which is unpredictable, unclear, and unconstrained by limitation periods. So in fact the decision of Justice Rothstein appears to be suspicious or even contemptuous of the phrasing and language used by the majority. Um, in, in particular, the statement of the majority that the facts of this case describe a rift in the national fabric is repeated by Justice Rothstein no less than four times, including twice in one paragraph, which I think is a clear sense that he's mocking what he sees as the overblown reaction of the majority. He kind of chides them for being in over their heads, um, saying, the resolution of historical injustice is clearly an admirable goal. The creation of judicial exemptions is not an appropriate solution. That's for the part of the case that is actually about limitation periods. But for the majority, and in particular the Chief Justice, I think this decision in the sense that we have to come to terms with flaws at the very heart of Canadian nationhood and sovereignty, I think for the Chief Justice have been transformative. Over the past year, we've seen her at least twice, um, suggesting that the era of the Charter is, if not ending, then being eclipsed by a new and pressing constitutional challenge, that of Section 35, um, Aboriginal Rights and Reconciliation. 
And so for this conference, at least, the implication that our relationship with the Charter is approaching maturity is an intriguing one, but as you can see, the change Justice McLaughlin is talking about is not reflected in the caseload of the courts. Manitoba Métis is the only um, Section 35 case that the court considered this year. So at this point, a very brief digression to point out what was happening after March and before November, of which perhaps more in a little while. Um, I'm going to cut short my discussion of this case, which is um, the harmoniously named United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 401. Um, it, it is a, um, a Section 2B case and a privacy case, and there are some interesting things about it, but I'm going to leave it alone for now. I just want to show you, for all you Edmontonians and mall rats out there, that is indeed a picture of the interior of the West Edmonton Mall. Um, so, but I'll leave that to move to the last one, no surprise, uh, Bedford. Okay, so, um, when just as kind of the drama of the Nadon appointment and the hearing was at a fever pitch, I think the members of the court must have been really relieved to um, have the chance to unleash their decision in Bedford right before most of the country took a break for the holidays. So talk about changing the narrative. Um, despite feverish anticipation, this was a decision that, that media had no difficulty selling as a happening. It's fair to say, I think, that the unanimous decision striking th all three criminal code provisions was anticipated by no one, at least no one in my, in my, of my kind of Twitter community and my Facebook friends and people I speak to on a daily basis. <laughs> so if you were the person who predicted this, um, more power to you. And well done. Um, the decision is remarkably concise and focused. It never veers from a narrow point. The provisions challenged in Bedford create dangers for sex workers. The federal government's attempts to discredit the testimony of the workers themselves or move the spotlight to the third parties who actually inflict physical harm all really fail to make any headway um, in this decision. There are many, many things we could say with respect to Bedford. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it from Professor Dufremont uh, later on in the day. Um, we could think about starred thesis. We could think about causation. And of course, we could think about the remedy. But Bedford's aftermath leads us directly to renewed questions about dialogue theory. What option does the federal government or indeed any provisional, uh, provincial or municipal government have now? As the, as the federal government kind of um, started up and I think has now concluded their consultation process, what constitutional space is left? Um, many have uh, commented that the apparent front runner in the eyes of the government, that is the Nordic or Swedish model of criminalization, focusing not on sex workers but on clients, would simply recreate the same constitutional problems that the court pointed to in Bedford. Um, no one seems to think it's open for the government to take a more aggressive approach and criminalize prostitution itself. Um, and other approaches can start to raise division of powers questions. So certainly, I mean, I think we're all going to be interested to see what the federal government comes up with as a response to this case. Um, and depending on what that looks like, we're anticipating either questions, I think, on the charter front or questions um, if the federal government declines to move and the provinces and municipalities start to move on this issue, we might be facing kind of some interesting division of powers issues um, going forward. If we had time, I think the last thing that I'm most interested in is the link between the first case, Quebec versus A, and the last case of the year, Bedford. And that link appears most clearly to me through all the language about choice. It's a bit of a truism, the, the way that liberty and autonomy and liberal democracies get set against values like equality or, in fact, rights like equality. Um, in Quebec versus A, we see once again um, an approach that ignores all that we know about the constraints on choice in favor of a completely kind of acritical, acontextual approach to the choices that people make when they decide to marry. Yet in Bedford, the unanimous court's approach to the question of whether sex workers are responsible because of choices for the terrible vulnerabilities they face in their work, we see the court take a much more careful and nuanced approach to the meaning of choice, the conditions under which choices are made, and the meaning of those choices in law. But um, we don't have time for me to talk more about that, luckily for you. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. And I don't know if we have any time for questions. 
I'll be happy to take some questions, but please don't ask me about the numbers because it's just counting. few minutes for uh, questions. Um, I have my own, but if you have questions, uh, please feel free to come up to the, uh, uh, to the microphones. Rosemary. Um, I, the uh, comment about choice, I'm also interested in that, and I'm, I'm glad that Ben's sitting there too, because it seems to me, to me that choice plays a huge role in the criminal law jurisprudence of the court in a really changing way. And also in insight, of course, choice was a really important sort of factor in the decision. So I just, um, I just wanted to say, I think it's, a, it's interesting how much choice is coming up in these different contexts and how the court is bringing different assumptions to their evaluations of choice. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I will say that um, one of the things about Quebec versus A is that with four decisions, you can actually read a lot of different approaches and certainly Justice Abella's and Justice Justice labels are extremely different, but the ones that prevailed in Quebec versus A and in Bedford are so opposed um, that it's it's quite striking um, in that way. Of course, it's also the case as um, as Hugo Sear comes up, uh, the the um, choice is anchored the uh, freedom of religion jurisprudence in recent years, and uh, as well as the criminal justice. So. A helpful theme. Uh, Professor Sear. Just a quick comment um, on Bedford. What is also interesting, which hasn't been noted, is a change in terms of the type of remedies that are used. This is the first case that I know of that uses a suspended uh, declaration, not in order to protect from harm, yeah. because actually that's the opposite effect that it will have, but just to, to not to uh, uh, brusquer les sentiments of some uh, people, which is yeah. really a, a, a first. Yes. And uh, I'm not even sure that it's going to be valid, because if you look at the right to be, suspect, to be subjected to the lesser uh, sentence, after at the end of one year, uh, this, this uh, section will be declared void. Therefore, anyone who is now in the process has not been sentenced. I think uh, should, what should be allowed to, to get uh, access to that uh, lesser sentence. Yeah, the question of remedies this year, uh, actually in that um, um, uh, Edmonton Mall case, the picketing case, and they also suspended the remedy for 12 months, but of course the context is completely different. And um, it, in teaching, I think it really made me think about the way that um, the Supreme Court would have failed the remedy question in Bedford, because not necessarily because of the decision they took, but because they made no reference to the rules they had themselves set out. I mean, I think the remedy is, is wrong, but the, it appears with no reference to the rules that they themselves had set out, which expressly um, indicate that harm in the intervening period is a si significant problem. And given the language of the decision itself, which is quite lovely, really, in terms of its, um, as a piece of advocacy. Um, given the language of the, uh, the decision itself, it's bizarre to find that 12-month gap created at the end and the kind of vulnerabilities that it obviously imposes with absolutely no reference to doctrine at, at that point. So um, I think we, we'll have to look for um, remedies again. The other suspension this year, as I said, was in that um, United Food and Commercial Workers case, but in that case, the Alberta government had actually asked that the court strike down the whole statute. That's the remedy that the Alberta government wanted um, because the, the problems with the act were so severe. Sonia, um, having passed many of my teenage uh, evenings after work at Foot Locker unsuccessfully trying to get into the Palace Casino, um, uh, can you? Can you, I want to hear a bit more about that. Can you say something briefly about um, the Section 1 approach in the um, Palace Casino case? So um, the Palace Casino case is about a piece of uh, Alberta legislation, um, privacy. It's called the Personal Information Protection Act. Um, and what happened in the case is that uh, the 
the, the strike went on for 305 days. So both sides were taking pictures and videotapes of people uh, crossing the picket line and picket line activity. And they were, and the union in particular was saying, we're going to post these at www.casinoscabs.ca, et cetera. So eventually four people complained about the picture taking and the threat to post on the internet to the Alberta Privacy Commissioner. The original adjudicator uh, didn't doesn't have jurisdiction over constitutional issues. It goes to the trial court. The trial court looks at the legislation. There's absolutely no exception that could apply to union activity um, around a picket line in the context of a legal labor dispute. And so all of the courts, the trial court, the Alberta Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court, they all agree that there's no exception, so there's a huge problem. The interesting thing about the Supreme Court Section 1 analysis is that they don't actually do oaks. They just talk about proportionality. And it's a little bit refreshing. You know, we've had complaints over the years about um, the problem of the judicial legislation that oaks created. Um, I, I don't know whether it really heralds some kind of new era because um, it, the problems in this case are so dramatic that it's quite an easy call on section one. Um, it's not a reflection of the kind of McLaughlin, I'm sticking to the government's, uh, to the government's stated objective at minimal impairment and the way that kind of the moves that that me, um, has kind of created also in Quebec versus A for Justice McLaughlin. But it is a different approach to Section 1 where you can't, you can't just call Section 1 Oaks in that particular case because it's something else. Okay. Well, I hope you'll join me in um, uh, thanking Professor Lawrence, and uh, we're going to do a quick transition over. Professor Bruce Ryder is going to be uh, moderating the next panel he'll introduce, so we'll go right from 10 o'clock to uh, 11.15 for your first refreshment break. So uh, stay where you are. Uh, we'll switch over and join me in thanking Professor Lawrence. Thank you.